The sport of professional boxing has had a training routine that over a hundred years of documented history, beginning in the early 20th century, has been remarkably conserved. Generally, the training of most competitors begins with a run in the morning, usually varying somewhere between three and six miles in length. After a period of rest, a fighter will proceed to the gym where the training session typically begins with skipping rope for rounds, followed by rounds of shallow boxing. Depending on the day of the week, many fighters will then spar for several rounds or hit various bags for rounds. Rounds on the mitts may also be included before moving on to calisthenics, typically the ending of the session with several sets of sit-ups. One of the reasons the training has remained so constant is that attempts to overhaul the old-fashioned training routine have achieved a mixed level of success. For instance, in preparation for his title defence against Riddick Bowe, having embraced all manner of sports science, Evander Holyfield's trainers bragged that he was the best conditioned athlete in boxing. His handlers call him the best conditioned athlete in the world he'll have to be to make it out of this. Yet going into the latter rounds of their first bout, it was Bo who had followed the traditional methods, by all accounts, with less brio and dedication than the Holyfield, who appeared the fresher man. It was really Bo's superior conditioning which won him the title in the later rounds. More recently, Conor McGregor used a training routine that will be considered unorthodox by old school boxing standards in preparation for his bout with Floyd Mayweather. After spending £300,000 on his training camp, he was predicted by some to shake up the boxing world with his innovative scientific training routine. No, no, I'm not showing you anything before the fight. You don't know what an MMA guy brings to the boxing table. We're the element of surprise. Element of surprise. Mayweather, in contrast, followed the old school routine, albeit in the opposite order, with him heading to the gym first and going running in the evening. I run between, it varies, five to five to seven miles, five to eight miles. In the fight itself, it was McGregor who gasped, looking completely exhausted by the 10th round. The triumphs of the old school training routine are not limited to the issue of endurance. There are many cases that can be found online of athletes from strength and power sports finding their athletic feats have a weak transfer to the boxing ring. For instance, on this occasion, novice recreational boxer Max Ortiz made short work of pro powerlifter Sean Lee. One of the latest boxers to embrace sports science is Kel Brook, who worked for at least five years with the team at Sheffield Hallam University in the UK. Off the back of their work with the boxer, they wrote this paper, Strength and Conditioning for Professional Boxing, Recommendations for Physical Preparation. I am going to go through this paper. It should be noticed, it is not 100% confirmed that this is exactly the training routine that Kelbrook followed. However, outside of any personal injury issues or perhaps muscle imbalances, it will be safe to assume that this is the routine Brook followed, especially as from the title, the set and rep ranges are targeted to the professional level. To get into the cardiovascular aspect of training, this paper cites a study which modelled an amateur boxing bout as best they could. From their study, they estimated that in amateur boxing, 77%, 19%, and 4% of energy was derived from aerobic, phosphocreatine, and anaerobic glycolysis pathways, respectively. So a primary goal of this training plan was to target the aerobic system. So the first training phase that Brooke likely went through, as recommended by Sheffield Hallam University for three weeks, was 30 seconds of all-out maximum sprints, followed by 3 minutes and 30 seconds recovery. This was repeated 2-4 to four times per week. The goal of this training was to improve the power in the legs and improve the aerobic and anaerobic system. The next phase Brooke went through, which lasted from weeks 8-3 to three of his training cramp, is probably more similar to old-school boxing road work. Runs lasting 4-8 to eight minutes at 85-90% to 90% of the maximum heart rate with 2-4 to four minutes of passive recovery for 4-6 to six repetitions. This was repeated 2-4 to four sessions per week from 9-6 to six weeks out and then 1-2 to two times per week from weeks 6-3 to three out. So taking these guidelines at their maximum duration, this would be 6 repetitions of 8 minutes running with 6 sessions of 4 minutes off in between rounds. This would represent a 1 hour 12 minutes workout. Taking the recommendations at the lower end of the estimate, it would represent 4 rounds of 4 repetitions with 2 minutes recovery in between rounds. This would represent a 24 minute workout. 
From two weeks out, the team at Sheffield Hallam recommended taper of 20 seconds all out running with 10 seconds off for recovery. They recommend doing four to eight repetitions of this of one to two sets with five minutes off recovery between sets. They recommend doing this one to two sessions per week. Presumably the final session will be done about a week before competition. The next aspect of training to consider is the speed, strength and power aspect of training. There are a couple of ways of looking at power in sports science. One way of thinking about it is power is equal to force times velocity. Another way of looking at it is power is equal to mass times acceleration. In this paper, a major aspect of improving power is by improving what is referred to as effective mass. This is a way of improving the bracing effect of the fists and the torso when it comes into contact with the opponent, therefore making sure the target, such as the opponent's head or body, accelerates away from the fists rather than the fists accelerating away from the target. One of the references that the paper cites details the challenge of increasing this effective mass whilst also optimizing the acceleration slash velocity end of the spectrum. At the beginning of the movement, muscle force will create limb speed. Yet if the arm is stiff through the movement, that will decrease the velocity. However, by the end of the movement, the muscle stiffness needs to increase again for optimal power as this will increase effective mass of the punch. To support the importance of development of a higher effective mass, the study referenced a paper that noted higher skilled boxers imparted more momentum to a bag even though the hand was not travelling faster. They also noted that in Kung Fu practitioners, striking a basketball controlling for other variables such as limb velocity and body mass, effective mass was important in creating a high strike force. The study noted that in MMA fighters, they intermittently used this pattern of contraction, relaxation, contraction, which might go back to the earlier observation about skill level. However, there are also physiological factors which will determine this contraction, relaxation, contraction ability. The authors note that fast twitch muscle fibers can relax faster than slow twitch fibers. There are also presumably neurological factors and coordination factors as you wouldn't want to contract, relax, contract again too early in the punch to decrease speed. To go through the strength training that was used, the goals were to improve both peak force production and the rate of force development. The team at Sheffield Hallam recommend going through a periodized program starting 12 weeks out with a strength phase, moving to a strength and speed phase, to a speed specific phase with a one week taper. The paper doesn't expand in detail on Brooks' boxing training as this was presumably left to his boxing trainers. It will be fair to say that most of the traditional boxing training such as heavy bag training and sparring would come under the speed endurance category. So going through the exercise selection, the first exercise they recommend are eagles, a type of dynamic stretch which they recommend doing at each phase of the warm-up. The next exercise that they recommend doing is a Spider-Man and twist which they recommend doing for the full first eight weeks. For the last three weeks, they recommend picking up the pace earlier in the workout with a lunge and dumbbell sweep. Moving on to a lunge with a twist in the first eight week phase to a lunge in a medicine ball wood chop in the final four week phase. Next, they recommend doing a glute bridge and a glute bridge variation of the strength and the strength slash speed phases of training. The next exercises are the Palov press moving to a rotational plank. These are core stability anti-rotation exercises which are presumably designed to increase the bracing force and effective mass, which was referenced to earlier. The final exercise is an overhead squat, which was only done in the first four-week phase. From the table, the next section of training was aimed at improving the rate of force development. Looking at the exercise selection, there is a mixture of power training and plyometric exercises. The first phase of training involves counter-movement jumps for four weeks. The next four week phase of training involves four weeks of drop jumps, considered by many to be the most surprisingly intense type of plyometric training. For the final three weeks they recommend moving to medicine ball wood chop wall throws. The next exercise they suggest is a broad jump, a lower body power exercise, before moving on to ice skaters, a plyometric exercise involving a rebound which will improve a boxer's ability to move laterally. For the final three weeks of training, things are switched to a medicine ball punch. Next up on the exercise list are lateral hops with a hold. Initially you'd think that this would be a precursor exercise to the ice skaters, but it appears on a different line on the paper for some reason. 
They next recommend moving on to medicine ball rotational throws and band punching for the final three weeks before the taper. In terms of weight training, they recommend a squat variation for the first eight weeks as a key lift. Presumably a back squat, front squat, zercher squat, goblet squat, or one-legged variation would all be good. For the final three weeks, they recommend moving to speed squats, where presumably some of the weight is taken off and the speed of the movement is increased. For the upper body, the bench press is recommended in the first phase of training before moving on to a dumbbell floor press and a landmine punch for the final three weeks. Various assistance exercises are also recommended, pull-ups, kettlebell swings and others. So in closing, the paper acknowledges that research regarding the physical preparation of professional boxers is limited. It is unlikely that at this point in the history of the sport, the training is going to be turned on its head. However, this routine does offer slight innovations in terms of dynamic stretching over static stretching, interval training over steady state cardio, whole body multi-joint strength training, power training and plyometrics. Many of the references backing these innovations are based on findings in other sports or in sports that are thought to closely resemble boxing such as MMA, so it remains to be seen if they are all the most effective use of time in training. On this note I will conclude my video and if you like this video then why not check out my video 6 ways to improve brain health in contact sports athletes.